All right, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Eddie Valentin. I'm a curator at the National Museum of the U.S. Navy. I'm pleased to introduce this month's speaker from the History's Branch of Archives Division, Dr. John Fahey. Dr. Fahey is a historian at the Naval History and Heritage Command. He has taught at the United States Military Academy at West Point, Georgia Military College, and George Mason University. He earned his MA in European History at George Mason University, and then went on to earn his PhD in History at Purdue University. His doctoral work focused on the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and while at Purdue, John received a Fulbright grant to conduct research in southeastern Poland, and he deployed with the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division to Kandahar, Afghanistan, as an intelligence officer. He is the co-author of Habsburg, Grand Strategy of the Napoleonic Era, and the Cambridge History of the Napoleonic Wars, and the author of the forthcoming book, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, uh, Prisma, Poland, a multi-ethnic city during and after fortress, 1867 to 1939, publishing in, actually, right now, um, under Purdue University Press. His talk today is entitled, Scared of Nothing, U.S. Battleship Innovation in the Age of the Dreadnought. Dr. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, so for starters, it's, it's Przemysh. That's just, what, just, how, just how it looks like, uh, <laughs> so um, actually I'm kind of excited. This is, um, so I normally have talked in Habsburg conferences and this is a big audience, big audience for Habsburg conferences. <laughs> so, uh, so appreciate that. Now, NIHC is putting together an edited volume on innovation in the, in the United States Navy, which will incorporate essays from some of the historians in this very room with essays uh, on topics ranging from gunnery to aviation to diversity to uh, computer design, unit of command, and some other topics there. Uh, as it turns out, chronologically, uh, my chapter is the first, and that's uh, appropriate, since it is on battleship design around, around 1905. While U.S. naval engineers uh, improved battleships in many important ways, they were essentially playing catch-up to the other great powers, uh, especially the United Kingdom. So why should we care about U.S. battleship uh, design in the early 20th century? Well, simply put, because it shows how, the, how modern naval design uh, process happens. Well, the pre-World War I Navy uh, did not lead the world in groundbreaking uh, innovations or technologies or ship designs like the USS, or the HMS Dreadnought, which was launched in 1906. The Navy's search for a better, more effective battleship led to fundamental improvements in naval design, such as all big gun uh, ships, or proposals therefore, uh, placing all the main guns along the center line and introducing super-firing gun turrets. Um, such innovations, though implemented by Navy engineers, were derived from the initiative of mid-level officers and technological insurgents, uh, as well as debates in professional forums and service boards, and the influence of civilian authorities uh, like the President and Congress. Though convoluted, contested, and imperfect, the U.S. naval uh, construction process in the early 20th century illustrates the, crit uh, the critical role that collaborative cr uh, professionalization plays in naval aviation innovation. So, turn of the century U.S. Uh, naval innovation took place in the shadow of the other great powers. The United States uh, started its modern fleet in the kind of 1880s, following a long period of naval neglect following the Civil War. Um, the Navy then joined a decades-long period of international naval competition prompted by new industrial technologies, assorted regional competitions, and naval enthusiasm around the world. Early battleships that the Navy built uh, look strange now, uh, featuring lopsided arrangements like the USS Maine, or bristling with a variety of disparate uh, mismatched gun calibers like the USS Iowa uh, there. Now, these different gun calibers had different purposes. Large guns, uh, those of 11 inches in diameter or greater, which you can see on the main turrets there on the, on the Iowa, provided long-range penetrating power, while secondary batteries of between five and seven inches in caliber could produce a large volume of rapid suppressive fire. While the smaller guns could not penetrate contemporary main armor, they could kill gun crews and destroy funnels, hurting the ship. Now, U.S. battleships differed from most other nations' capital ships by also carrying a set of intermediate guns. So we have main, intermediate, and secondary. These intermediate guns were usually eight inches in caliber, and you can see some on the, uh, the Kearsarge here. They were not main guns. They were designed to fire somewhat rapidly at long range in support of the main battery. These guns were the topic of some debate among naval architects. Although the caliber had proven um, useful in the Spanish-American War, they complicated U.S. ship design and gunnery, 
which, oh, oh, which you can see on the Kearsarge. Um, Kearsarge, commissioned in 1900, had an eclectic array of weapons. Two turrets with two 13-inch guns, which you can see uh, there, the big ones, each topped with an additional turret carrying two 8-inch intermediate guns. This is all supplemented by 15, or by 14 8-inch guns on the broadside. And I should walk around this turret, this uh, podium, but so it goes. All right. The idea was to that for the 8-inch guns was to provide greater forward firepower, but this design proved unwieldy as 8-inch shells had to be lifted um, through the 13-inch turret, slowing the loading and firing of both sets of guns. Moreover, these, both these turrets turned as a unit, uh, meaning that they were incapable of in independent firing and aiming. Now, the main, or the second main, Virginia and Connecticut classes, uh, which were all commissioned between eight, 1901 and 1906, all carried eight 8-inch eight guns, in addition to four 12-inch main guns and over a dozen secondary guns in the broadside. These vessels carried their intermediate guns as chasers uh, towards the bow and stern of the ship, which you can see uh, there. Um, or sometimes as wing turrets amidships. Now, there are many, many flaws with a mixed caliber uh, battleship. Magazine management is a nightmare, um, given the gun's disparate effective ranges. Uh, even worse, accurate fire is extremely difficult with mixed guns. Because at the time, the simplest way for a gun to engage a target was to adjust fire uh, depending on the splash of the preceding round. With multiple splashes from, gun, from guns of different ranges and capabilities, adjusting fire was essentially impossible, a problem that had resulted in embarrassing gunnery during the Spanish-American War, which you should talk to Chris Haverin about, because he's the gunnery guy. So is that him? Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay, all right. I'll come over here. All right. Okay, okay. All right. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. Okay, all right. Now, solving the problem of naval gunnery was complicated. I'll go back here. Sorry. Sorry, I'll go back. Sorry. So, so you met you. Yeah. All right. Um, it was complicated, but essential if battleships were to be a effective and uh, cap and um, credible fighting platform. It would take new firing techniques, which again, talk to Chris Haven about that, but also new ship designs. The Navy's um, structure did not make these reforms easy. In the late 19th century, the Navy lacked any central coordinating staff beyond the person of the Secretary of the Navy himself. Instead, the Navy was administered by a series of bureaus divided up by function, such as the Bureau of Navigation, Ordnance, Construction and Repair, Steam Engineering, and so forth. The chiefs of these bureaus met regularly uh, as a board of, uh, on construction to determine designs and needs for ships. Their proposals were in turn uh, evaluated by the Secretary of the Navy, who might or might not forward these requests to Congress. Congress then debated and might or might not approve them, who knows. Um, after appropriation, if it happened, the Bureau of Construction and Repair oversaw contracts and construction for the next several years um, as the ships were built. Now, frustrated by the Navy's inefficiencies during the Spanish-American War, President William McKinley created the General Board, which you can see there, um, led by Admiral Dewey, Dewey at the time, uh, in order to coordinate force design, advise the secretary, and create naval policy. The board's mission quickly grew to include ship design. However, the general board had no formal authority over the other bureaus, much less over Congress, of course, so its control over ship design revolved around personal connection, persuasion, influence, the whims of legislators, newspaper articles, public opinion, whatever, um, which makes it interesting. Now, Faced with this convoluted and uh, decentralized appropriations process, U.S. naval officers leveraged professional publications like the U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings and the Army Navy General Journal to advocate for reforms and improvements to the service. The Navy had only recently become a professional organization in the modern sense, uh, a process, by the way, par paralleling developments in law, medicine, education, engineering, and other skilled fields. The Naval War Office, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and journals like Proceedings, which uh, here's an example, were only a few decades old in 1900, and the General Board, as mentioned, was brand new as a product of uh, post-Spanish American War reforms. Proceedings was particularly important for communication and professional development, serving as the main way for naval bureaus to spread information and encourage dialogue between officers, uh, even to this day. In fact, um, Proceedings brought up a, a wide variety of, of topics uh, for discussion, which you can see if you have very good eyes. 
uh, on this uh, table of con content here. If not, just go to the library and pick one at random. Um, <clears throat> many of the suggestions of, uh, in proceedings revolved around changing gun gunnery, armament, and also ship design. For example, in 1902, Lieutenant Matt H. Signor published a proposal for a new type of battleship that advocated for a battleship with cruiser endurance and an armament of two triple 13-inch guns, uh, main turrets, and two triple 10-inch intermediate turrets, which you can see at the waist uh, of the, the design there, along with secondary batteries of five and three-inch guns along the, the, the broadside. Signor's proposed ship displaced about 17,000 tons at a time, which is ambitious, at a time when the recently launched Ohio uh, weighed a mere 13,000 tons. Signor considered the use of superimposed or, or stacked turrets like we saw in the Kearsarge, um, and he argued that that stacked turret arrangement gave, quote, a manifest superiority to guns so mounted, which is not true, but whatever. Um, but he preferred adding a third turret, a third gun, excuse me, to each turret for simplicity's sake. While his proposal was not adopted, triple gun turrets would become standard uh, in future decades. Now, more importantly, Signor's article prompted some discussion and proceedings, including a comment by Naval Academy professor Philip R. Alger. Alger opined that rather than a mixed battery, quote, I should prefer eight 12-inch guns. This is probably the first published proposal for an all single caliber big gun ship. Meanwhile, Lieutenant uh, Homer Poundstone, you can see he's to the uh, right of the ship in the middle. That's the best picture I could find. There's not good pictures of him, but sorry. Um, uh, so Poundstone experimented with ship armament in a series of battleship plans that would eventually apply Alger's suggestion. Now, Poundstone had worked with ordnance for most of his early career. In 1901, while sailing with uh, gunnery reformer William Sims, who you've probably heard of, um, so they had sailed to Samar on the armored cruiser New York, Poundstone worked out a couple of designs for possible U.S. warships. He called his initial proposal USS Feasible, a mixed battery ship with four 11-inchers, 12 7-inch guns, and eight 9-inch guns, but sized up to 18,000 tons, which again is huge for the time. He made some improvements to the turrets and other designs, but the design was fairly similar to earlier US ships. His second design, USS Probable, because I love his design, his names, but involved um, upsizing the secondary armament in number and caliber to 14 9-inch guns. The next year, he sent a paper to President Roosevelt arguing that the Navy should upgrade its 8-inch guns to 9-inch, those, those intermediate weird, weird size guns. Roosevelt liked the paper, so Poundstone published it in the proceedings, suggesting that future battleships should carry a broadside of 7-inch guns with 9-inch gun intermediate turrets and 11-inch inch main turrets. Oddly enough, Poundstone wrote that this arrangement would be, quote, reasonable, logical, practical, and feasible, and to be infinitely preferred to what is apparently now regarded as the highest attainable battery combination for our most powerful battleships. As noted, it would not improve gunnery, but whatever. Um, although Poundstone's proposal for a large, upsized, uh, mixed gun ship was published in 1903, by then he had already moved on to prefer a single caliber ship that he called USS Possible. Um, he wanted possible to be 19,000 tons and capable of 20 knots. And I apologize, his plans are somewhere. A lot of places claim to have them. I, they don't seem to, so this is as close as I could find <laughs> to what the ship would have looked like. Um, so it's uh, capable of uh, 20, 000, 20 knots. Its most uh, notable feature, though, was its guns. Um, this is, a, like I say, a mock-up of it from uh, Scientific American. Poundstone proposed arming the ship with 12 11 inch guns, uh, anyway, um, distributed in six turrets, two on the center line and two on each side, as you can see, as well as a battery of small torpedo, defense, uh, torpedo boat defense guns. This innovative plan eliminated secondary and intermediate weapons, relying entirely on the long range power of the main guns. Such an arrangement would simplify gunnery and enable the Navy's improvements in fire control systems to have full effect. Playfully nicknamed the Scared of Nothing, um, which is a great name, P Possible was a revolutionary proposal and possibly the first all-big gun ship ever designed, we think. 
Unfortunately, Poundstone was hospitalized in 1903 with a severe and career-ending case of arthritis, which prevented him from directly participating in further developments uh, in naval architecture. He did, however, submit plans for possible at the encouragement of Sims to a uh, request for the Bureau of Navigation the next year. Now, officers like Poundstone, Sims, and Signor constituted one of the great strengths of, US, uh, of the U.S. Navy. Willing to propose and develop solutions to the Navy's problems, they pushed towards better gunnery and larger, more effective battleship designs. Of course, these officers had support from high places, including President Roosevelt, but their initiative greatly helped the U.S. Navy. Once they had proposed improvements, the next step was to persuade the boards and professional forums, along, of course, with endless rounds of testing, modifications, and refinement. Now, as it happened, the time was right for Poundstone's design, as naval experts and enthusiasts in 1903 and 1904 were warming to the idea of an, of an all big gun ship. Wrote an article in Jane's Fighting Ships in 1903 calling for an all 12 inch gun ship, fast enough to hunt down cruisers and strong enough to kill battleships. Once this idea was out for Poundstone and Comberti, um, naval institutions began to embrace it. The all big gun ship concept was discussed at the Naval War College's uh, 1903 summer uh, conference, and in October, the general board asked the Bureau of Construction and Repair to conduct a feasibility study on an all big gun ship. Now, as we said, the Bureau of Construction and Repair does not work for the general board, so the Bureau ignored the request. Even after the general board repeated it in January of 1904, um, they eventually, uh, designed a ship with a mixed 12-inch and 10-inch caliber in September of that year. So it only took a year of requests. So really good. President Roosevelt got involved in October, so the next month, asking William Sims for advice on big gun ships. Sims assured him that the great majority of our naval officers um, have been long convinced that all big guns is the only logical battery for a fighting vessel. Roosevelt then sent a memo to the Bureau of Construction and Repair advocating for an all big gun ship, which the Bureau punted by asking for more time to consider such changes. So again, it's all, nobody works for anybody. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things. Now, as the Bureau took its time, events in Asia drove home the importance of an up-to-date Navy. In 1904, the world watched as Russia and Japan used modern battleships in fleet combat for the first time. Prompted by fears of Russian encroachment on Japan's spheres of influence in East Asia, Japan launched a surprise attack on the Russian fleet stationed at Port Arthur in February of 1904. Now, the initial battles mostly featured torpedo boats and destroyers, so Scientific American wrote in May 1904 in an op-ed, what naval men are hoping for is that there may yet be a fleet engagement in which the battleship will be given an opportunity to demonstrate its powers of attack and defense. That wish was granted the next year at the Battle of Toshima in May of 1905, where Admiral Togo, the, the white-bearded guy in the middle of that picture, uh, sank or captured 11 Russian battleships, killing over 5,000 Russian sailors, capturing another 6,000 while losing three Japanese torpedo boats. The Russo-Japanese War was a powerful lesson on the importance of effective modern ship design and encouraged naval development around the world. On March 3rd, 1905, so before Toshima, but after the start of the war, Congress passed a naval authorization bill for two battleships that would eventually become the USS South Carolina and the USS Michigan. Those are battleships 26 and 27. Both the General Board and Sims' and insurgents wanted these ships to be as large as current European models. A fiscally-minded Congress limited them to 16,000 tons, the same as the previous Connecticut class. This created a problem for uh, Rear Admiral Washington L. Capps, who was the um, chief of the Bureau of Construction and Repair. Now, Capps had been convinced that all big gun ships were the way forward, but was constrained by the ship's congressionally approved tonnage. While, uh, while, previous, while, while previous all big gun designs like Poundstone's placed some of the turrets on, on the sides, um, the, um, uh, the, the appropriated tonnage for South Carolina was too small for more than eight 12-inch guns, uh, which create a problem. These are actually a variety of some of the designs proposed at the time and around. Um, as you can see, some of you know, most of them have guns that are either offset or put to one side or the other, which um, increases the number of guns, thus the tonnage. 
Um, but caps can only put eight because of the tonnage uh, constraint, constrictions. Less limited, caps decided on a radical new approach, placing all four of the guns of the ship's main turrets along the center line. Caps' design also introduced super firing turrets. That's when you have uh, the rear turret in each pair elevated, enabling it to fire over the bow and stern respectively. Now, this seems natural, super firing turrets, um, but it was an innovative setup finalized only after tests on the monitor Florida showed in um, March 1907 uh, that the uh, format would not damage the ship. Super firing turrets, of course, have many advantages for space allocation, firing arcs, and just general efficiency. Most importantly, the new super firing center line arrangement, which you can see uh, number three, uh, Michigan there, Michigan's the sister ship of South Carolina. Um, uh, let's see, uh, sorry, sorry. which you can see there, um, would allow it to give all of its guns on the broadside, right? Um, Caps, of course, recognized that the most important aspect of any modern ship, since they'll be fighting in line, was the throw weight of the broadside, and so that tactical doctrine shaped the physical layout of the ship. The Bureau of Construction and Repair completed plans for South Carolina and Michigan by the end of June 1905, well before the Royal Navy started its own radical and error-defining all-big gun battleship, HMS Dreadnought, in October. So we beat them. So good for us. Um, Though the plans are ready, the concept of an all, oh, and here, here's South Carolina, you can see the guns elevated there. Although the plans were ready, the concept of the all big gun ship was still a new idea that would be challenged by conservative officers and politicians fearing the expense, especially as South Carolina and Michigan would not be laid down until December of 1906 and not commissioned until 1910. These things took forever. Um, Admiral George Dewey, as part of the, uh, the general board, had to advocate for and repeatedly defend the new setup. He wrote to the Secretary of the Navy, Charles Bonaparte, in uh, September of 1905, that, quote, it has been clearly shown by experiments in practice in fire control that the fire of a mixed battery at fighting range cannot be accurately placed with two or more calibers. The general board has for some time believed that battleships should have a battery of large guns of but one caliber. Now, as mentioned, the United Kingdom took the first concrete step to an all big gun battleship, laying down a uh, dreadnought in 1905. Commissioned to be in 19, uh, 15 months later, dreadnought was a revolutionary ship with uh, 10 12 inch guns and an impressive speed of 21 knots, made possible by a new, sturma, uh, t new turbine steam engine. Scientific American was typical in calling it an extraordinary ship, unsinkable by any weapon except a ram. The ship, of course, gives its name, dreadnought. To all, to all large, all big gun battleships built from that point forward. And she prompted a worldwide rush among the great powers to revamp their Navy's battleship fleets. However, thanks to Poundstone's work and the plans for South Carolina, the United States already had designed its own answer to the ship and allocated funds. The General Board was thus able to write to Secretary of the Navy Victor Metcalf in 1907, um, after Dreadnought was launched, that Dreadnought's design is, quote, substantially the same as that proposed by the General Board three years ago in January 1904. So, good for us. Despite the General Board's enthusiasm, South Carolina and Michigan's construction and the launching of Dreadnought, all big gun ships were still considered controversial among some naval circles who attempted to use Navy's, the Navy's uh, professional forums to influence public opinion against the ships. Most notably among these was Alfred Thayer Mahan, I assume you've heard of. Uh, Mahan weighed in on the topic of battleships, writing in Proceedings in 1906 that the Battle of Toshima discredited the idea of large, all-big gun battleships, like Dreadnought or South Carolina. He instead argued that large numbers of smaller, slower battleships with a, small, with a large secondary armament would prevail over larger, faster battleships with long-range guns. He wasn't always right, Mahan, I, I, I guess. Um, this was a shot across the bow of Poundstone, Sims, Signor, Caps, and the General Board. Captain Richard Wainwright responded to uh, Mahan in the next issue of proceedings, pointing out the value of speed, better gunnery control, and efficiency of larger ships before asking, quote, are the best ships too good for the American Navy? I note uh, Richard Wainwright should 
asked that question, he was the executive officer on the main. So when he asked, are the best ships too good for the American Navy, you know, he had a reason to ask that. Mm. Um, anyways, a few months later, William Sims, um, shown here as the czar of gunnery, uh, which is a great, yeah, wonderful thing. Uh, William Sims thoroughly refuted Mahan's uh, analysis and proceedings a few months later, showing that his conclusions in, uh, upon, about Tashima were, quote, in error because they are founded upon largely mistaken facts, mistaken principles of gunfire, fire, and upon an apparent failure to consider the inherent and very important tactical qualities of large vessels. So, it's a nice takedown. Sims showed that the Japanese long-range gunnery had been key to their victory and that Togo had used higher speed to remain out of the Russians' optimal range. He also demonstrated the tactical uses of speed um, and that Mahan's proposal smaller ships result in unwieldy battle lines. He reminded his readers that the US had to keep pace with other countries if we were to remain a world power, and that, at the time, meant dreadnoughts. Sims' article answered the fundamental question on battleship armament, and from that point on, naval officers and civilian naval enthusiasts generally advocated for all big gun battleships. Even Mahan admitted the weaknesses of his initial paper. Writing a uh, wave of popular enthusiasm for dreadnoughts and naval expansion, Congress authorized the construction of the 20,000 ton, 10 12-inch gun Delaware in North Dakota, that's battleships 28 and 29, in March of 1907, these ships were much larger and faster than South Carolina and confirmed the move towards the all big gun future, even as America's pre-dreadnought Great White Fleet set sail for its voyage around the world. It's an interesting changing time. So in conclusion, a long conclusion, but still conclusion. Um, dreadnought style battleships served as the yardstick for naval power in the years before World War I, despite advances in submarines, aircraft, and torpedoes. Constantly refined and improved put Michigan up. They illustrated the effectiveness of America's naval designers and innovators, uh, at least if you're a dreadnought enthusiast, then you like them, I guess. At a conference at battle on battleship design held in the summer of 1908, Rear Admiral Casper Goodrich, commandant of the, US, uh, of, the of the New York Navy Yard, proudly argued that the British with dreadnought had, quote, produced a ship which our own and smaller Michigan need not near fear to tackle. Goodrich was not alone as Jane's fighting ships of 1907 called South Carolina, the, the sister ship of Michigan, the quote, best all big gun ship yet put in hand. Launched in 1908 and commissioned in 1907, sorry, 1910, excuse me, South Carolina and Michigan provided a valuable addition to the fleet, though like most battleships of this era, uh, they never saw combat, US battleships. Rear Admiral Richard M. Watt, chief of the Bureau of Construction and Repair, used the global influence of South Carolina to celebrate and illustrate the influence of US naval innovators. He wrote in 1911 that the designers of the war vessels of the United States in their first all big gun battleship adopted as the emphasized feature of the fighting machine a battery arrangement, which after experiment with various other battery arrangements is now generally expected by the designers of all nations as the standard battery arrangement of guns for the all big gun battleship. In this setting, the standard battery arrangement, you're right, uh, of fighting vessels, the influence of the United States on the world's battleship design cannot be overestimated. I'll say that again. The influence of the United States on the world's battleship design cannot be overestimated. Although Dreadnought and her immediate successors used wing turrets, the United Kingdom followed South Carolina's super firing center line uh, gun model from the Orion class on. Likewise, Italy's Dante Alighieri, Austria-Hungary's Prince Eugen, France's Breton, Germany's Koenig, Russia's Gangot, and Japan's Congo classes all used center-line super-firing gun turrets, as did all US battleships after South Carolina. By proving able to not just build its own warships, but to innovate and contribute to battleship design, the United States Navy demonstrated that it had a place among the great naval powers. More importantly, the development of a credible dreadnought showed the United States had a process that, though convoluted and slow, could result in innovation and real improvement. Officers like Poundstone, Signore, Sims, and Caps, institutions like Proceedings, the General Board, and Bureau of Construction and Repair, and participatory civilian oversight from the Presidency and Congress all contributed to improved U.S. battleships. 
These institutions and forums would be the battlegrounds for further innovation and in ship design for decades and would eventually give birth to true U.S. naval supremacy. Thank you for your time. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Yes, Heather. They've been sent to Rensselaer or Harvard or MIT to 
was studying the architecture. I'm a little less clear on the steam engineering guys, but, yeah. the, but the, the core construction guys, what's their real sea time experience? They don't have it. Exactly. No, very much so. Whereas cities and panels, at least, you know, yeah. these are guys who they see, they see how things operate. And, you know, and then, you know, the construction core guys, I, I think, you know, CAX is an exception, I believe, they're kind of like, they're, they're more resistant to something because, you know, they, well, as I said, you know, they, they kind of ignore the presidents for a little while, you know? <laughs> there's a real differentiation in, you know, the line guys, I think, by and large, want to move faster yes. than the construction core. Oh, absolutely. Actually, um, yes, there's a couple couple thoughts on that. So, um, yeah, there is definitely that differentiation, 100% for sure. And you see that, that's why the general board is so important. That's why proceedings and Congress bugging them and stuff, that's why that is so important, because they are still fucked, just to a certain extent, um, for sure. Uh, the other thing is, um, you do get some, a fair bit of professional jealousies and, and infighting back and forth. One of the most, I didn't talk about this, this paper, but one of the more kind of significant moments, and emotional moments for a battleship design comes in 1907 because uh, Henry Reuterdahl, who's an artist, he, um, and he's also a friend of Sam's, um, he, he's an interesting guy, he like sailed with the Great White Fleet and stuff. Anyway, he wrote an article for uh, Clearer's Magazine that was probably mostly written by Sims complaining about the design flaws of, of battleships. Talking about, oh, these hatches don't close the right way, or this, this gun is like right over the magazine, this is stupid. Like all kinds of just uh, things that you understand if you're on a ship, uh, you don't necessarily understand if you've been hanging out wherever the Bureau of Construction is, right? wherever they're based. Uh, and so when you've got these kind of public spats, these public arguments and stuff, uh, that, that is when you get the Bureau of, of, a Bureau of Construction to actually Change things. But thank you. Yeah. All right. I can tell you about the name, too. Definitely don't have the name. <laughs>